take a seat. We're just going to keep that spirit of reverence. I know I'm going I'm to spend at least two minutes of my time so we can just keep this confession of faith. You know, we're so glad you're here to the faithful volunteers at Arise Conference with these awesome shirts on. We love you. Wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you for giving up a whole weekend of your life. And for those of you uh, who didn't make it last night, I'm glad you made it this morning. Nobody gets credit for coming to a conference at night. You should, but only the real spiritual people come to the morning meetings. Can I get a spiritual amen? We're going to sing it real quick. It just says, I'm wide awake. Because we sing this at our church as well. And I love it because the symptom of depression is too much sleep. And I love sleep more than anybody in life. I believe that, you know, God doesn't move until there's double digits on the clock. But I do know that when someone's just tired, they just sleep when they should be awake. And I pray that, you know, in the next 35 minutes as I pave the way for uh, Pastor Cameron, the good looking one. <laughs> no offense, sir. You're both awesome. If she comes to preach the word after I do, I'm believing that God's going to open your eyes to something. Maybe it'll be an idea. Maybe it'll be somebody to, you know, to pray for. But we don't believe in having church meetings because church meetings can't change anybody. We believe in opening up our eyes to the risen Savior. He can change everybody. Can I get that? Let's sing it out and wide away. Come on. Come on, stir it up. Lord, I thank you that there's nothing in here that anybody has done that's not greater than your grace, not greater than your power. Lord, we speak freedom this morning. Lord, I pray you would lift the head of the discouraged and remind people that the creator of heaven and of earth is for them and nothing will stand against them. Jesus, we speak life to every dead corner. We speak hope to every bit of despair that might have tried to creep in this place this morning, Jesus. We thank you. Believe it. Somebody shout amen. Man, it's on fire in here. There might be some of the coolest people ever in New Zealand. I'll tell you what. Been in some cool churches and some uh, faith-filled meetings, but I'm pretty sure this ranks right up there with them. Harlem. Yeah. Some of the deep south of America are known for faith, but there's something brewing here. It's awesome. Although there's more sheep than people. <laughs> New Zealanders are so awesome, that's okay. God's gonna do something in this nation like we've been saying, and uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to Pastor John, who, yeah, yeah the first thing is thank him. I was actually gonna make a joke, which was just a thank you for putting me behind Pastor I. Thanks for nothing, okay? <laughs> When you're speaking with a, a man like that, you don't want to speak as far in front of him as possible. Like, what are you, like Pastor, I could be like, go jump into a lake of fire and, you know, stay there. He'd be like, yes, sir, you know, immediately. But what he was doing, just in case you don't know, he was uh, imparting. 
And sometimes, you know, I love taking copious notes, but sometimes it's okay to just kind of drop your pen and just go. Because it's not sometimes what's taught at a conference, it's what's caught in the spirit. And uh, just a huge shout out to the Cameron's for having the faith to even put this on. You know, churches don't necessarily gain monetarily or any way, really. It's more of a withdrawal from a church to have a conference like this, but they do it because they love people. And I just got, I know there's a lot of senior pastors here, and I'd just like to say from, you know, a 34-year-old perspective, just want to thank you for your years of paving a way for a generation like mine to be able to lead churches and fight battles that are easy because of your sacrifice. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to pray. And I think you guys are over here. If you'd allow me the honor just to have everybody in this conference maybe turn this way. And if you're a senior pastor or pastor, can you just lift your hand real quick? We just want to pray with you. Can you stretch your hands out? And we're going to believe that God's going to open up heaven. God's going to open up a fresh chapter. Father, I thank you for the years of sacrifice so many men and women have put in decades of serving you, Lord, that battles we will never know, heartache we will never know, valley seasons, Lord, where they could have quit, but they kept on fighting, Jesus. I thank you that there is no sunset season when you're serving God. It's all sunrise, that there's no day where we're done, Lord. We're going to keep on fighting until you call us home. Jesus, I pray for every senior pastor, every leader that's represented here. Jesus, I pray increase. I pray your blessing, God. I pray for a fresh passion to rise up in your leader. We stand together today in unity, Lord. We might sing it different, even preach it different. But Lord, wherever the name of Jesus is lifted up, we pray that you give your kingdom ground like never before. In Jesus' name, as you believe, and somebody say amen. amen. Thank you. Give somebody a quick hug or a handshake. Can you give this worship team a huge hand? Thank y'all. You're amazing. Yeah, you know you're staying, bro. We should have got you a recliner. What's your name, by the way? Of course, it's something cool. It can't be like Carl or Mike. It's what? Shaham. Shaham. Thanks. I'm going to talk to my AP. So are you the worship, like, director, pastor, mogul? <laughs> awesome. Do you want to say anything? Go ahead. <laughs> it's great to have you here. <laughs> I bet you can really sing, huh? Sing, sing, I'm wide awake. Just sing. Because I'm wide awake. I'm wide close. I'm close. Oh. Sing it again, I'm wide awake. Sing it like a black guy, though. I'm wide awake. Yeah, you're going to Oh, my heart is yours. Oh, fear. for faithful men and women and the man playing these keys lord he's faithful thank you he's fought behind the mountain he's fought outside of the spotlight lord and i pray god as you usher in a new season for this church lord that there will be a soundtrack to revival that there will be a, a soundtrack of people walking out of tombs walking out of the hospital walking out of death into life in jesus name man Somebody, can you feel God moving in here? It's awesome. You can sing. You know what we call that in New York? We call that sagging with an A. 
Okay, take your seat. We could just do that the whole time. I'm trying to um, slowly push your pastor, John, into, you know, he's a prophet. And uh, I saw him preach a couple years ago at Hillsong, and I was kind of jet lagged and tired. This guy got up there, and I remember just hopping to the edge of my seat. And I'm like, who's this? And Joel Houston was next to me, he's like, that's John Kim. Like, I should have known him. Like, my bad, I should have known him. <laughs> But he's got a gift to break chains. I believe there's something about um, you know, a prophet's gift that you have to stir up. And I think when you're a senior pastor as a prophet, you can't take it for granted. And you gotta keep on drawing it out. And who knows, maybe I could finish in maybe 15 minutes. We can get John up here just to prophesy you know, over people's lives, direct, indirect. Anybody have a prophecy shirt on today? Any fluorescent colors? Any single people in the room right now? Here's your word, celibacy. Gotcha. Yeah, I was praying about what to preach this morning, and uh, right in the middle of Pastor Hot, I just felt like God, you know, kind of would lead me to preach this message, and I kind of put a whole bunch of parts together, and I believe hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. It's such an honor to be here. I can't begin to express, um, you know, what a privilege it is to speak to you, that you come and give your time to hear an American, no less, speak to you that you really don't know. It's an honor. And uh, thank you for imparting into my life, my children's uh, lives. I just, I'll show you a quick photo just so you can pray for us. Y'all have it up there. Um, no, those are lyrics. There they are. So there is my wife, my little guy, Roman. That's Ava. It's Charlie. That's where we live in Brooklyn. And uh, we appreciate your prayers. You know, when you uproot your family from Virginia, where we had like a yard and a fence <laughs> to go to Brooklyn, New York. Uh, you know, it, it, the toll on your children is what you don't really plan on. And God is faithful. But if you think of us, um, we pray that my daughters never leave the home ever. <laughs> they don't find anybody till they're 80 and I'm long gone and I can't watch it. <laughs> But thank you for praying for our church. We need you. Can we count on these New Zealanders, these crazy, faithful people to pray? All right, write this down if you don't mind. Call this message Church in the Wild. Church in the Wild. There was a street poet named Sean Carter who wrote a poem that was put to music later that won some awards. And the poem that he wrote, it was called No Church in the Wild. And Basically, what I got from this song that became a pretty big hit in our country was there was a couple guys saying that they are so far out there in the world that there's no church out there, meaning they're untouchable, they are unreachable, and the whole song, I mean, people really grabbed it and loved it, you know, no church in the wild, meaning like we have graduated. We are at a level where there's no, there's nobody out here, I mean, no church in the wild. And I remember hearing the song for the first time, pulling off the road going, oh, they've just never been to our church yet. <laughs> They've just never been to a place like Arise. They've just never been to our church. I mean, there is a church in the wild because we serve the God that goes into the wild for people. And in Hillsong, New York City, I think we're similar to maybe where you guys are at and some of you senior pastors where we don't have it all together by any means. One time somebody was like, I'm not coming to church because there's hypocrites. I was like, well, you should fit right in. We are a bunch of fallible human beings desperate to hang on to the cross and get better every day serving Jesus. But one thing we do have, it is a clear identity. We know who God has called us to be, and I don't believe it's just for our church. I believe that my pastor, Brian and Bobby, have mandated it for churches like ours to be the type of church that is actually in the fight, in the wild. Wherever people are, God's people should be there too. Wherever there is pain, we should be there. Wherever there's a party, we should be there wherever there's somebody grieving. We should be there wherever there's somebody who's on a mountaintop. We should be celebrating with them whenever anybody's sick. We should be there wherever you see Christians typically running from. I believe there's a new wave of churches running directly into that same exact fire. There is nobody that is unreachable. There are no cities that are untouchable. There is not a corner of this world that should not have the love of God walking in it because you showed up. Church in the wild. It's about understanding that God doesn't want us building these big monuments where we open up our doors and we expect the world to flood in. I believe we should do what basically Pastor Ott's doing and what my pastor's done for years where we take ground and build a church because we have to and take more ground and build a church like we have to. It's more like, um, I guess, a triage unit in a war. 
Rather than build like a big palace and expect the world to flood in, we go after people just like Jesus did. When we get there, we build a church. You go into your high school and you basically build a church. You go anywhere you work, wherever you are, grab another believer and be the church. Sometimes people are never going to have the wherewithal to come into church, but that's okay because they might run into you and your life. It's the only gospel they may ever read. This is the essence of Church in the Wild. I'm going to read it to you where we get it in scripture. I don't know where my water went. Anybody get less than two hours of sleep last night? Cheers to whoever you are. Do you like who you're sitting next to this morning? Make it work. If you have a Bible, quickly go with me to Matthew. And I'm going to teach you about a setup prayer real quick. I love churches that set people up. Have you ever like answered an altar call and it sounded really good with all the music? And then you went and tried to live it and you're like, oh, it was a bad idea. I shouldn't have responded. Water baptisms. That's kind of like what Jesus did with this prayer. He was talking to his disciples and he was probably frustrated with them praying ridiculous things. And he told us how to pray. But you got to be careful when you read this prayer and when you do what Jesus said, because there's always something behind it. It sounds glorious when you read it, but when you actually kind of try to get in the context of what he was saying, here's what he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. I'm reading from the message paraphrase. It's not a literal translation, but in this respect, it's right on the money. Go check it out for yourself if you don't believe it. Somebody once said, what's the most spiritual translation of the Bible? I said, the one you read all the time. <laughs> People arguing about what translations to read. Like, if you just read the Bible, you'd know that. Anyway, that's another message. 25 minutes. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right and do what's best as above, so below. Oh, I love that. Reveal who you are. Set this world right. With the inference being, this world is wrong. I keep kicking this over. The whole point of this is an aggressive attack of perfect heaven invading very sinful earth. This is church in the wild. Wherever people are, that's where God is moving. Now, have you ever um, kind of like been in a situation where you're, you're there, but you're not really all there, where you're kind of like sleepwalking through it, which is why I would ask your pastor, we could sing that song to kind of spiritually even wake us up, where you're, you're going through the motions. You know, as a dad on Mondays, you know, we used to have seven services. We got a little bit of a bigger building, so now we're down to six. And our last one starts at nine, so I'll get up at like 7 a.m., you know, try to pray and eat breakfast with my kids and then go preach. Literally, you know, we have a 10, 12, 2, 4, uh, 6. Um, now we have an 8 and a 9 because we have another little venue. We're just taking over little churches, you know, and they'll let us, which is awesome. And, you know, I just would be tired on Monday, and I was trying to take my kids, you know, out to a movie. I had a great daddy-daughter date with my little girls. I'm like, we're going to go see a movie on Monday. So I can pretend that I'm a good dad, but really I can just sit there and zone out and read my phone and like, we're going to go see the movie Up. Remember that sweet little movie? Great. No problem, right? So we go and I'm so tired. I'm just buying my kids candy and we go into the movie. And I'm like, oh, finally, sit down, girls, watch the movie. And, you know, five minutes later, I hear gunshots. And I'm like, there shouldn't be gunshots in the movie Up. And I look up and we are in the wrong theater. We're watching Inglorious Barstools. <laughs> someday when they just figure out that this whole life they were going through the motions worrying about the wrong things worrying about things that do not matter and when we get to the end of days we're going to look back and realize this was not a game we weren't just playing church that there was life and death on the line every day
to realize that there is literal life and death hanging in the balance everywhere you go. Wow. And if this conference serves one purpose, I pray it's just to enlighten you, maybe open up your eyes, that you're not just doing what you're doing without purpose. God's hand is on your life. You're not just a stay-at-home mom with your kids. You're an evangelist moving. You're not just going to school. You're called to actually change your school. You're not just serving in church. You are an essential part of the movement. Without you, it can't happen. You might not be on a stage, but if you don't do your job in the car park, somebody gets offended before they can ever even hear what happens up on a stage. It all has to work together. So let me give you a reminder. There are no notes. I just figured out I was going to preach this like 10 minutes ago and these guys are good but they can't read minds just yet so can you write this down again I told y'all last night if you don't want to get to heaven and have to show notes from this conference they have like very little to show you might not get in it's going to be a tough theological thing a frankly arise conference warning the casualty to a growing vibrant church is personal comfort but if it was never about you, you should be just fine. If it was never about you anyway, you're going to be all right. People love to pray for a growing church, but getting a growing church is different than praying for one. People love to have prayer meetings. God open up the gates of heaven. And then when the gates are open, you're like, oh, Lord. I don't know if I like this because it's not comfortable. Go back to read it even in the New King James. It says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means that God is invading. Where there's sickness, he's going to bring healing. Where there's mediocrity, he's going to bring greatness. Where there is bondage, he's going to bring freedom. This is an absolute fight. There's no snuggies. There's no s'mores. There's no Christian karaoke. There's no feel-good moments. I mean, you start finding out what you're about when your personal comfort gets tested. And I just came to maybe remind a couple of you that when God starts to disrupt your comfort zone in your own personal life, don't always ask to be delivered. That's probably what you've been praying for. When you see your church start to shift, make sure you understand that that's probably God trying to reach more and more people. And just before you go pray about getting delivered or maybe God's not doing what you want him to do, understand that what you lose in a growing church is personal comfort. But if it was never about you anyway, you should be all right. You should be just fine. And I really believe prophetically that God's going to start shifting things in churches. It's going to be a new wave of anointing. When the focus is off you, it only leaves the focus to go one place, other people. Think about that. If your whole Christianity revolves around you, it's the shortest walk with Jesus of all time. But if you can shift your eyes, focus is off you onto other people, you are going to be wildly effective. The alternative, just so you know, is uh, living with a disease called me. Me, my comfort, my stuff, my vision, what I like. I mean, it's unbelievable. I was telling the young people uh, yesterday, those rowdy, faith-filled revivalists. Not the leaders of tomorrow, the leaders of right now. I always used to hate that when I was a young person. You know, the leaders of tomorrow. I'm like, what am I today? <laughs> people will get like frustrated with they want me. I remember like people, this is, what, this is what the disease of me sounds like. Well, I don't even know if I really like coming to conference anymore because I used to come and I used to know everybody, but now I show up and there's like all these new people, right? And I used to have my seat in row four and I used to love that seat, right? It was my spiritual seat. I used to pray for that seat for years. I used to, I even bought the chair. Someone was sitting in and one time I came in and now they got these moving lights. Why do we even need moving lights? Jesus didn't have moving lights. And one time a light shined right on my retina and I got a bad retina as it is. And man, we started singing new songs. I don't even like some of the new songs. What's wrong with the old songs? If we are going to sing the new songs, we can at least sing it in the key of A because when I worship, I like to get my worship on. It's a little bit higher than what they're singing. And plus, I don't even appreciate the way Pastor John is preaching now because he's not really preaching to me. It's not really ministering to me. It's like for my friends and stuff. And I don't come to church for other people. I mean, I want to get fed. I want to feel like I'm feeling the presence of God. And I feel like lately, you know, even when I try to worship, there's all these new people who are in my worship space. And when I like to worship, I like to get both hands up. And now my church is so crowded, I can only get one hand up, and plus, I just feel like there's no room, and then I try to leave and get my lunch date at Applebee's, there's a traffic jam, I don't really feel like our God is a God of love, would cause me to miss my lunch date, I mean, if our church is really organized, I mean, what about me, what about, hey, not about you! Religion. And if it ruffles a few feathers, we're not trying to be antagonistic.
pessimistic for no reason, but at the end of the day, we're going to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. Are you willing to lay it down? People always say, I'm going to lay my life down to Jesus as long as you know people are going to be walking all over you the rest of your life. I remember talking to a guy, because you know, religion to me is a bigger enemy than the devil. The devil is defeated, but religion is alive and well. So many people have no problem with Jesus. They just can't get through the church to find him. Oh yeah. I got awesome parents. Grew up in a church that, they didn't have a church like this, so my parents just took me to whatever, whatever church was preaching Jesus. But I remember it was like Old Baptist Church, which is awesome. I learned a lot of great things there, but the worship was different. I'll never forget my mom and dad, you know, at our house, in the Lentz household, we worshiped because they got saved in the Jesus movement. So my dad brought his tambourine. Please believe that my mom and dad were the only two people hands lifted, tambourine waved, and they did not care. They were not worried about what people thought. I remember I grew up understanding that there's religion and there's a relationship. We have to do everything we can. If you believe that people are dying without Jesus, if you believe that without him there is no life, which we profess and proclaim to do all the time, then you will do whatever it takes in your church to believe God at the expense of your own comfort, to believe that he's going to really save people's souls. I had a, a granddaughter bring her grandmother to our church, and she got saved, and she told me the story. She said, I thought that my life was done. I was in a sunset season, but I came to your church, and uh, I found Jesus again, knocked over my water for the 19th time. I found Jesus again, and I believe that the, my, my best season's right now. And she sits in the front row, and she has earphones on because she's like, Carl, the music's way too loud, but I'm cool. I just want to be a part of a move of God. We had two guys call there in the hip-hop industry, and, and they said, Carl, can you, can you pray for us? And I said, yeah, yeah, for sure. And they took their hats off. I said, why did you take your hat off? They said, well, my mama said that. My, I said, hey, no, no offense to your mama. She ain't here. Put your hat on. We were praying to a God who was murdered naked for you. I'm pretty sure that your two inches of new era cotton aren't going to scare him. I'm not praying to you. Put your head on. <laughs> this is not about just being antagonistic to old traditional religion. It's about understanding that we have to meet people where they are. I mean, we're not ever going to sacrifice the message because it's sacred. But the method can change at any time. I'm going to give you two choices in 13 minutes that a church in the wild, in this context, it's big C, not little C, as a, the body of Jesus Christ. I believe there's two choices you can make every day that will set the course for a move of God wherever you are, in your workplace, in your house. But number one is this. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm glo so glad I'm sitting next to you this morning. So glad. So glad. So glad. So glad. So glad. Look at the other person. Choice number two, and say, I pray that I would sit next to you. Okay. We must have a lot of single people in here today. There's a lot of married couples, you know, it's just a real quick pack. <laughs> but if you have single people in church, single neighbors say hello. 30 seconds later, you're like, hey. Number one, the church in the wild chooses the power of God over the process of religion. We follow the path of the Holy Spirit, even if it leads to uncharted waters. You can make this in your personal life. Write it down. Church in the wild chooses the power of God over the process of religion all day long. We follow the path of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm in New York City, so we have like pseudo-intellectual, you know, Christians who want everything to match up and everything to have a format. Please preach to me long expository sermons, use words I don't understand that make me feel spiritual, but make me less effective. Expound on Leviticus, make it match up to Revelation. Teach me. Mentor me. Make it work with the ages. Maybe people want to have it all match up. The problem is... That our God has been defying process since the moment Jesus set foot on this earth. All he did was make sure that every process was shaken so people would get their eyes off the method and never miss the message. Yeah. 
It said it last night. They wanted like a rabbi that was going to heal perfectly. They got this wild man who was spitting on people and they were getting healed. He was walking into tombs and pulling people out. He was walking into leper colonies and hugging people. He was eating dinner with sinners. They wanted a king on a royal stallion and they got what? A carpenter on a donkey. God is still doing that today. We need to understand that our God is going to defy your process. He's going to break your religious box sometimes. He's going to bless people and you're not going to understand it. He's going to elevate those who he wants to elevate. He's going to heal those who he's going to heal. He's going to give grace to people that you don't think deserve it. He doesn't need your approval. Our God doesn't need you to like it. He is God and he is going to change our city whether we like it or not. Because you're caught up in some process. God can't move like that. JD can't have hair that long. <laughs> Music can't sound like that. You can't preach like that. You know that's been happening for centuries. If you're not careful, you can miss the miracle right in front of your face. And I'm going to read you my favorite story in the Bible. We've got like 97. This is in Mark chapter 2. If you're with me, go there real quick. Pray that you read your Bible. You know it works on Monday too. <laughs> if you're new to church, don't feel awkward. You know, when a pastor said turn to whatever book. Just take your time, go to the table of contents. Don't fake it and be in Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to miss the miracle right in front of your face. I pray every day. I know I've done it countless times in my life already. I just try to make a vow to God, Lord, I will always look for you in the middle of things I do not understand. I do not want to find myself looking back, missing out on partying with somebody who got, you know, a healing or rejoicing with someone who got a breakthrough or missing the chance to grieve with somebody that was hurting because my religious box was so tight I refused to break it even though you're the ultimate religion breaker of all time. Mark chapter 2 says this, after a few days, Jesus returned to Capernaum and word got around that he was back home. A crowd gathered, jamming the entrance so that nobody could get in or out. And he was teaching the word. They brought a paraplegic to him, carried by four men. When they weren't able to get in because of the crowd, they removed part of the roof and they lowered the paraplegic on his stretcher. Impressed by their bold belief, impressed by their tithing. Impressed by their church attendance? Impressed by their religiosity? No, nope. impressed by their bold belief. Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. Some religious scholars, you trace that back into the Greek, it's going to be translated haters. They started whispering among themselves, He can't talk that way. That's blasphemy. God and only God can forgive sins. Now let me just give you a quick summary again, y'all. Somebody carved a hole in the roof. Can you imagine if tonight Ox preaching, Pastor Rush Ox preaching, and you hear a buzz saw, <laughs> and the roof starts caving in, and somebody lowers somebody else down, and the guy's paralyzed, and then he gets out of the chair and starts doing the W. <laughs> and like, I mean, worst case, it's the, like the best entertainment of all time. Best case, you cannot be the same. But there were a couple of guys who were so focused on the process that they missed the miracle of a man walking. Can you believe it? And we like to judge the Pharisees, but I call it the spirit of religion. And that's like a converse Chuck Taylor. It never goes out of style. And before we pick on people in the Bible, it might be time to take a little bit of mental inventory and find out if that spirit of religion has been inhibiting your ability to see Jesus in any way. Spirit of religion, when you just can't let go and let the Holy Spirit take control. I pray in my church that there's a spirit of freedom and a spirit of religion It has no weight in our church because we don't want to be, I mean, do you know what would have happened? I mean, the Bible, if you know your context, that roof would have been so thick and they would have had to carve through it and there would have been mud flying. It just would have been awesome. But I've seen it in our church, even in the past couple of years, we've been there for three years now. And once in a while, I'll get an email that is just unbelievably ridiculous. All the pastors know what I'm talking about? 
I'm gonna write a book someday when I'm 90 called emails that I got when I pass through the church. I'm putting names in there, I'm putting photos. <laughs> and this, this person, this woman wrote me an email and said, um, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the church forever and ever, amen. If you ever get an email titled like that, watch out. <laughs> and she said, you know, I just would like to say I really enjoy my time at New York, uh, Hillsong, New York City, except for everything. <laughs> I cannot believe that during church news, you played an instrumental of a secular song. By the way, I don't even know what that means. What is secular? What is Christian? Is there a certain amount of times you need to say Jesus for music to be Christian? Do a certain amount of people have to lift their hands? What if you're a Christian and you sing music? Shouldn't that make it Christian music? I mean, is there like a genre? Is that why we call things Christian? What if I told you that there are people who sing Christian music but don't love Jesus because they found out you can make a buck quicker? Conversely, what if I told you there's people in the music industry who are willing to sacrifice religion just critics because they want God to take them in a covert manner to sing music and sing melodies that people don't overtly know are about Jesus, but they lead people to him. What about that? Different message. Woo! A secular song. Ah! A secular song was played during your church news. I just believe it was demonic. I believe that you and your family are demonic. I kid you not. It was of the devil. It is a disgrace. It is an abomination. It was unbelievable, and I pray that you repent. Have a great day of grace and peace. <laughs> I remember reading this email. I was going to respond, and I thought about Pastor Brian. And then I was going to respond. I felt like writing, Dear Jezebel. <laughs> I didn't do that. I said, Ma'am, I'm so sorry. That you were offended, you know, by the, the 30 seconds of instrumental music that we paid, but we played. I'm sorry about that. But while you were writing your dissertation of hate for our church in the 30 seconds, did you by chance meet the people sitting behind you? Because their marriage was over a couple months ago and they gave their lives to Jesus and now they're going strong. Did you by chance when you were judging the music, did you tap the guy in front of you? Because he was a dry addict and he is now free. Did you happen to see at the end of the service? Three or four hundred people leave oh. Jesus on your way to you. Did you happen to see that maybe God was doing something that was bigger than your little box? So I love you and I'm sorry that you were offended, but we're going to keep on doing what we have to do all time. Here's what I'm trying to say. You know, we're not trying to offend people. And we're not trying to hurt people's feelings, but at the end of the day, if you put this picture of Jesus up, can you put it up? Look at this closely because I know that Jesus offended many to get to me. So I'm okay if some people get offended as we try to get people to him. He was bruised and he was battered and he poured it all out so you and I, to the scorn of everybody on this planet, turned their back on him. He did it anyway. Can we be a part of churches that are okay if people don't understand us, if people criticize you, if people talk about you? Is it worth it if one person finds Jesus because we got out of the way? Oh, I believe this move of God is going to happen. Worship team, come on up here. We're going to choose the Holy Spirit every time. Because the church in the wild believes that God might lead us into areas we don't understand. It's a mystery, but He is not. Circumstances might be shaking, but He is the rock of ages, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Church in the wild, number one, chooses the power of God. Number two, as we close, the church in the wild. I forgot to throw this in there, but I believe God wants me to remind you, live the kind of life real quick that makes religious people mutter, non-believers stutter. I pray that you live the kind of life where religious people mutter about you. Non-believers, oh, well, you, you what, how, how, how? You did, you did well, how, how many people got, who got healed? Who, you got, what kind of idea? You got what promotion? You didn't even graduate college? How many of your kids are doing well in the middle of that society? What religious people make them mutter? Non-believers make them stutter. 
It's how you know you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Number two, a church in the wild chooses to see what others have chosen to ignore. If we look in the shadows, there are opportunities and there are people and there are human beings waiting to hear the good news of the gospel. A church in the wild chooses to look where other people and other churches chosen to ignore. How many moms do we have in here? Have you ever seen a mom? My wife's amazing. And there's something about a mom that had the ability to just ignore screaming children. You can have a conversation with a mother and her kids can be lighting fires, robbing banks, and just be, I don't know, like, so good. Like somehow they're still locked in with you. I wonder sometimes if God looks at my life and he looks at churches and he wonders, can y'all hear the people crying around your churches? Can you hear the people dying? I mean, you're praying all the time when we're talking, but while you're going to your prayer meetings, you're stepping over dead bodies. While we're building churches, we're forgetting that the people that are falling by the wayside, they are the church and we're supposed to be reaching them. I pray that we can be the churches that shift from looking into the spotlight. Jesus has got that cover. And we go dipping into the shadows because in those shadows, there are people who desperately need our God. In my own life, I know that sometimes we get pegged as evangelists. And I always tell people, I don't think I'm an evangelist. I think I'm just tired of missing miracles. And we pawn it off. Oh, that's an evangelistic guy. I don't think so. I remember one time I was walking to church and how much time do I got? I got one minute. Walk into church and I uh, felt like God said, go talk to your friend that you see. I just flicked split on somebody. It's anointed. <laughs> and across the street, I saw a guy that I had not seen in years. And he was what I like to call street pharmaceutical rep. <laughs> And I'm like, Lord, I don't have time for people. I'm going to pastor church. Immediately felt convicted. God sort of opened up my eyes. So I ran across the street. I'm like talking to this guy. I'm like, what's going on, man? Where have you been? What have you been doing? We exchanged stories. I said, look, I can't believe this, but I'm a pastor in a church. You should come check it out. He's like, man, my brother like me coming into church. Man, the roof would fall in on my head. How many times have you heard that? I'm like, dude, I work there. It's still standing. You're good. <laughs> Like, all right, I'm going to come. I'm going to check it out. We exchanged numbers. Five, six years later, I'm giving an altar call at church. And if you're new to church, altar call is a fancy term for giving an invitation for people to leave a life of sin and death and come to know Jesus. And the last guy to walk in out the door, basically off the street, was my friend that I had not seen for five years. He walked right down front. I hopped down and I said, like, where, where have you been? Like, I can't believe you're here. This is awesome. It was like five years ago. I said, Carl, the moment... I turned around that corner after you and I had talked. The FBI had been staking me and my whole organization out. I got arrested. The last human being I talked to that was not a cop or a judge was you. I sat in a prison cell for five years and thought about that stupid church invitation. And thought if I ever get out of here, I'm going to go to church and say we got one, Woo! one TV station in our cell block. It was your church's TV program. I couldn't get away from that. Do you know how many people are in your world that need Jesus? No microphones, no spotlights, no bands. Just Christians ready to be the church. As we close, I want you to just go back. When you read that story in Mark, I think it's verse 3 or 4, it says, Some men, some men found a way in to get their friend. Healthy scripture conjecture leads us to believe that there would have been other sick people at that meeting. There would have been other people who were crippled, other people that were blind, but says some men refused to take no for an answer. They're like, no, 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 there's a shadow opportunity here. It looks like it's not gonna work, but work, there's a shadow. There would have been other friends that were like, sorry, crippled friend, two pack, maybe we'll make, wait till the next century for the Messiah, sorry, buddy. But there are these four guys who were like, forget that. We're going to get our friend to this guy because he's dying. He's been on a mat his whole life. And evidently this dude heals. So excuse me if I cut in line and excuse me if I hustle my way through. But I'm getting somebody to Jesus. And I read this story. It says some men. And I like to liken it to New York City. Like the, I think the first guy, he would have been like the New Yorker who's like just the crazy one. We got to get in there, guys. And the second guy would have been like the crafty analytical New Yorker. We're going to need a rope. 
And the third guy would have been like the guy who can make it all happen. Like I know a guy who knows a guy with canal who can get a rope for like half off. And the last guy would have been the rich New Yorker. Like I got the money. And together they would have been like, you do your bit. I'm gonna do my bit. And then all together I can't get them by myself. But if you take your rope and I take my rope and we wrap them up, and you do your bit, I'm gonna do my bit. We can get a friend to Jesus. So you do what you're called to do. I'm gonna do what I'm called to do. And we are gonna get our friend to Jesus. And look, we don't ever know the names of these people. But I'd be okay someday if the history books look back in New Zealand and the history books talk about New York and there are no names and there are no photos, but all it says is some men and some women decided to do whatever it takes.